I mean, there were times where I'd be like off on my pedals. More often than not, the sun was shining and I'd have the biggest grin on my face. I got goosebumps quite a lot, actually, which is really funny. Typically from nothing, like when I say from nothing, I mean just from by doing exactly what I was doing by virtue of living this dream. I'd say I'd be off on my pedals and I'd have this huge grin and then like my whole body would be covered and I'd be like, I'm doing it. I'm actually doing this. And it was just wild. It was like so, it was amazing. Welcome to the Seat Travel Ride podcast, where we share the stories and experiences of people who have undertaken amazing adventures by bike. Whether it's crossing state borders, mountain ranges, countries or continents, we want to share that spirit of adventuring on two wheels with our listeners. Hello, I'm your host, Bella Malloy, and I'm very excited to introduce my guest for today's episode of Seek Travel Ride, Pippa Langan. In October 2022, Pippa set off on what she deemed a trip of a lifetime. Ahead of her, a solo cycling expedition that would see her set sail all around the world. Eight months later, she reached her finish line in New York, crossing four continents, 24 countries, and having pedaled over 25,000 kilometres. I'm really looking forward to, and you can understand my excitement, at getting into the details of these very experiences of Pippa's monumental trip. Pippa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Pippa, I am stupendously excited to listen to your story. And actually, listeners of the podcast, you may be interested to know that my interaction and knowledge of Pippa herself is actually through a previous guest, which is that of Lizzie Jenkins, who I interviewed way, way early on in the podcast in episode four. Lizzie sent me a message saying, hey, I have a friend who's done something pretty big on a bike. You might want to reach out and interview her. And she introduced me to Pippa. What a gift that is. Pippa, you're not the first person that I've interviewed that's done something big on a bike that's crossed so many countries and pedaled such a vast distance. And I'm looking forward to drilling down into that. But the question which I like to start with, and I ask all my guests, is a pretty simple basic one. And that is, do you remember the very first bicycle you ever rode? No. <laughs> Short answer. I, I don't really remember cycling much as a kid. I'm sure we did. But my first bike that I really remember riding is a battered old pink rescue bike that I found in Sweden at 19 years old. So no, got no idea. My first my first bike. I'm sorry. So let's track back to Sweden then. 19 years old, battered pink bike you're rescuing. Is it like from like a hard rubbish roadside sort of collection or something? Or We just found it on the side of the road and it was like, oh, sweet, this bike needs a home. Took it home, didn't do anything with it. My mom came to visit, pumped up the tires, oiled the chain. And I don't think I even used it very much. But yeah, that was definitely, that's the first memory. How terrible is that? My first memory of being on a bicycle. But I think it also transports me then to, obviously, you discovered the passion for cycling as an adult then. Because it's very different to go on a massive monumental cycle tour in the way that you did, which was sort of lightweight bikepacking style to rediscovering cycling as a 19-year-old picking up a bike that was left for ruin on the side of the road. So how did cycling come into your life in this way? I started riding properly as an adult in when I lived in New York. I was there in 2012, 2013, which was when the City Bike subscription came in in New York. And I signed, I was like, oh, this sounds really great. And I joined and it was just the most fantastic thing. And from that moment, I just cycled everywhere around the city because it's the quickest way to get around. And then did no cycling. So that was like a couple of months and I did no cycling for a couple of months. When I went away to Canada, I did a ski season in Whistler, BC. Then I moved to Toronto and the public transport again was rubbish. So I got a, I borrowed a bike and rode it all summer. Then I had years off. Yeah, I moved to Sydney, didn't need to cycle to get around there, Austria to do another ski season. So there was big times where there was nothing. And then there were times where I'd like intensely get on a bike, but only ever to get from A to B. Moved to London, same thing. First couple of years. Nothing, nothing really interesting in terms of my bike riding. It just, I would cycle everywhere all the time when I was in the city. And then a friend or a couple of friends introduced me to London Brighton cycle race, which is 50 miles to do in a morning. And we did it. It was fun. And I was like, oh, I quite like this. But really, I got into cycling properly in COVID. So lockdown happened. I wasn't doing the A to B cycling to get around because we weren't going anywhere. And I was like, oh, I really actually miss my bicycle. So I started cycling just to ride like an hour at lunch 
and loved it. And then my little brother got in contact and was like, oh, some of my friends are doing the North Coast 500 this summer as a cycle tour. If you want to do it with us, you've got to train. So I said, okay. I borrowed kit. I had cycling shorts with holes in them. I was wearing sneakers on my bike and I would cycle around Regent's Park in the morning with all the other pro cyclists who looked great. And I just looked like a bit of a jumble sale kid, really scraggly put together. Anyway, did the North Coast 500 and loved it. And that was with Lizzie. And that was the first time I met Lizzie. And uh, yeah, there was like 11 riders. Maybe, maybe that's an exaggeration. Sorry. Seven riders and four people in the support car or something like that. Eight days. It was fully supported. We had a, we had a car driving around with all our stuff in it. And I loved it. Then me and Lizzie started cycling a lot together. And then the year after, so that was 2020, 2021, me and my brother did Land Centre John Roads. That was, you know, we, we had never cycled packed before. So we were like, oh, we have to go as light as possible because we don't know how we're going to get on with the distance. Lizzie was a great help in deciding what we needed to take. The week before me and Lizzie had done, we did like a night ride out of London. We were trying to go as far as we could. Our ambition was like 600 kilometers in, in 24 hours. I think we did 340. So we didn't do very much, but we we tested it out and we had our little, we had our kits, we had our setup. We bought sleeping bags. We slept in a barn that night. We stopped at like 1 a.m. and slept till 5. We were both so cold. They were the worst sleeping bags ever. Was this the barn? Yeah. Oh my gosh, you're the person that rode with Lizzie and you slept in the barn, I think, were there rats or something? Rats, yeah, <laughs> I love this. I love everything about this. <laughs> Maybe not the rats. Yeah, I mean, it was an experience, wasn't it? So then anyway, we did that. Yeah, me and Finn, we did Land's End to John O'Groats, smashed it out and had a great time. Although Finley hasn't really gotten back on his bike since. And obviously I was like, for me, it was like, this is it. This is what I really want to do. Six months later. I went to Sri Lanka on vacation to visit my parents who were living there at the time. And I had decided I didn't want to do a beach holiday or rather I wanted to do an active holiday. So I took my bike with me and circumnavigated the island. And it was on that trip where I was just like, this is the best thing I've ever done. I really want to go bigger, go longer, go further, go faster. And so I did. And that was how I came to plan a cycling trip around the world. Sorry, that was really long. Oh my gosh, no, it was absolutely perfect. No apologies needed. It's such an amazing way that from the bike being the perfect tool of transport, of commuting from getting from A to B, because it's a quick means of travel, in, especially in a crowded city, to then all of a sudden creating memories and adventures with friends in that way, to then realizing, oh, actually, I can combine my love of seeing places and traveling and it's not just a short A to B commute. I can actually use this as my way to discover. I absolutely love that. So then that trip through Sri Lanka sparked off the desire for the round the world adventure. Sounds like from what you were saying there that you've lived in many different countries and had different experiences. From what I gather there, the outdoors is definitely something that you really enjoy as well obviously ski towns and ski seasons is something that's been in your life is summer outdoor activity something that you've also sought out as well not actively like we were a super active family growing up we did orienteering as kids and camped a lot outside and we lived in like I grew up in the middle of the country and um, so there was a, there was a lot of time spent outside but as an adult, I guess I kind of moved away from that for a period of time. Yes, I lived in, you know, I lived in big cities for periods and then I kind of counter that with, but I didn't, I wouldn't say I really did many summer sports. Say biking was only ever just a way to get around. And it wasn't until, yeah, I realized that cycling meant that you could just be outside on days that you wouldn't usually be outside. I mean, I think that's one of my favorite things it's like when it's raining or when it's miserable it's great it's like people wouldn't typically choose to be outside but I can't I have this fantastic thing that I'm doing that I love and it doesn't matter yeah I'm sure if it's sunny it's awesome but it's also awesome if it's snowing or raining or miserable because it's just like yeah as I say if it wasn't for that I'd probably be inside and outside is definitely my preferred state of being the idea that you have a passion which takes you outside which means you're not inside and yeah it's bad weather but you're still outside because of it I love that little anecdote that you've developed there it's also one of those things and it's probably the way that as humans we reflect back on experiences and memories but often the most inclement weather and, and not ideal experiences are the ones that we fondly remember the most I, I I feel so anyway like like the hardest days 
unless it's like heat wave conditions, the hardest days for me that I often recount the most and, and are instilled in my mind at least are often the ones that are done in not so great weather conditions. And I'm not sure if you're, if you're similar that way. So uh, my sister, I have, so I come from a big family, two brothers, two sisters, and I have one sister who lives in Norway. And she says the Norwegians have an expression that life is better lived outside. And ever since I heard that, I'm like, yeah, that's it. That's where I'm at. That's who I am. I just, I am more myself when I'm outside. So let's get into this outside because eight months of cycling 25,000 kilometres, and I don't really want to get into the stats too much. I'll say them once more now, and then let's see if I can skip out on saying them again. 25,000 kilometres, four continents, 24 countries, eight months. Seven months and two days. Oh, sorry, seven months and two days, which again goes to the distances that you were travelling each day because you're certainly, whilst you're travelling on a bike, it doesn't mean that you're not travelling far on a bike daily. You had some massive daily distances there, but also massive amounts of time of yours spent outside. Possibly fair to say the most time spent outside in a seven-month period in your life, probably. Absolutely. What aligned in your life to be able to take this much time away and actually set out on a journey like this in the first place? So I, when I, in my like adult life, I finished university and then I traveled and I spent five years living and working in different places around the world. And it all just kind of, you know, it was intentional. It didn't just happen, but it also just happened like being, uh, oh, I met some people and then I went there and I did something different. And then I ran into some visa complications. And so I was bound to the UK for a while to get over these visa complications. I was like, okay, cool. I'll stay in one place and I'll get a serious job and I'll grow up a little bit. And I did. I completely fell on my feet. I got this amazing job at an amazing organization in London who were so incredible. Like, as I say, as my first grown up job at, I think, 26, maybe 27, they were, yeah super understanding and allowed me to do a lot I worked hard and they also allowed me to travel still and work from different places which was awesome but it was in COVID after being with them for three years that I was like oh I'm starting to struggle I really want to do something different I think I want to go back to that adventurous lifestyle of skiing or working and doing in different places learning different things London is not home for me but it kind of is you know I grew up in the UK I know London it feels very familiar it feels that, you know, it do, it feels very familiar. Absolutely. And so, but in COVID, you know, when I tried to hand in my resignation, my boss was like, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> you're locked down. Like, don't worry, just stay. And then I stayed. And then I started getting into cycling. And then I got in with a cycling shop in North London. I started like interning to learn more about my bicycle with Hub Velo and Clapton, who were just so awesome. So then I was like, okay, so I am getting fulfillment in a different way. You know, it's not, I don't have to live somewhere else. It's just learning something different and then I did land center John Groats and then as soon as I came from that back from that I started to think that I was going to do some kind of big adventure so I didn't need to rush out and do it immediately and anyway at work I was set on a project it was a contract for a year and I was like okay cool I'll get I'll see this through and then we'll see what's up and then it was as they in Sri Lanka and when I had these feelings these feelings I said really wanted to consider it. I wanted to make sure it was the right thing to do because it is hard to leave a job that you love and people that you love. And it is hard to leave a place and people that you love. So it was a tricky thing to decide. But yeah, six months in, I was still feeling the same way. So last June, I was like, that's it. I'm going to hand in my resignation. And yeah, everything did just align. You know, the project was coming to an end. It felt like the right time. I didn't know what kind of career path I wanted to go on. And so it was like, great, sweet, I'm going. And sorry if this is skipping ahead a little bit, but having done that, I very quickly decided on my ride. I was like, I don't want to go back. There's no chance. I don't think that I want to go back into that. Coming back now, it's funny because I went into work and they were like, oh, it's awesome to see you when it comes back. And I'm like, oh, I don't think I'm going to. <laughs> I didn't say that quite like that, but yeah, I'm changed. It changed me. It couldn't not. It's not like this was a split second decision to leave. You've obviously, something kicked off on that early trip in Sri Lanka, which gave you this thought. And you've obviously had things that you've had to consider. You know, you're talking about visa complications, keeping you hemmed in in a way, but adjusting to that. But then also the considerations of leaving and what you're doing. But yeah, you can't go on a trip this big and not have it change you and change how you want to experience things moving forward as well and what you do day to day as well. So 
So I guess then when you decided to set off, had you always had the intentions of doing it in the manner that you did in that you were like, be, and, and and I know I've said this before. Like I, I've interviewed people who've cycled and are still cycling around the world, and people who have got two panniers on the back, two panniers on the front, other things. You know, fifty kilos of gear, everything they need to live to see the world. Your setup is very very different. We could look at your bike in some of your photos and think, are you actually in an ultra cycling race? Because it's it's so lightweight to the degree where you didn't even have a tent packed. You had a bivy bag. Am I right? Yeah. Wow. Did you always have it as an intention that this was the only way you were going to travel? Like for for a bike, it had to be a lightweight setup? No, I just, I, yeah, so you're absolutely right about the intention. You know, the intention was there. I was thinking about it for a while. It wasn't like a split second decision, but I'm also, I'm not a very kitty person. I was like, I'll just go and I'll make do and I'll figure it out along the way. I mean, this is the thing. How do you know if you've not done a trip that's massive before? How do you know? And what do you, what do you do? And, I think I looked up online, like how some people packed and, but then I just very quickly came back to what, but I already know what I would need to do the jog, for example. So that is essential. And what more do you need to cycle around the world than you need for 10 days in the UK? It's in the tent. The UK can be so volatile. It was like, you know, I had warm stuff. I had waterproof stuff. I had things that would keep my mind like a Kindle and a Sudoku book. And then what else? You just need one pair of off the bike clothes and some flip flops and you're sweet. I got woolen socks and a better sleeping bag. So I upgraded my kit before I left on my world trip. But again, it was just like, I can't think of anything that I more than I need because it was really, for me, I did, although I didn't really have the, like, it, it wasn't all planned out. I didn't know exactly where I was going, but I did have the idea, like I'm doing a physical challenge. I want to push my body. I want to see how far I can go, how fast I can go what my body is capable of rather than like oh I'm gonna go to all these beautiful places and check things out you know it was really it was very much about the riding okay so that that's really cool that that was sort of in your intention there I also love that your kid upgrade was really like a pair of woolen socks and a sleeping bag like that's awesome <laughs> Wool, woolen socks for the win and I still wasn't warm so definitely and the sleeping bag wasn't right so <laughs> again always learning you're always learning right because I didn't I didn't really change my. I changed a little bit as I went round. I added in some bits. I took out some bits. To Southeast Asia and Australia, I switched out my bivy for a hammock and a lighter weight sleeping bag. And then my mum sweetly kindly sent my bivy and my sleeping bag to Australia to meet me there. And my woolen socks because I didn't take them through Asia. I switched them out for a bikini. <laughs> so, you know, like there was like, little bits that changed. Yeah, absolutely. But on the whole, no, that's what I have. Actually, I have to ask, because I've often been curious, were you in like an enclosed hammock or was it just literally a hammock? Literally just a hammock. I should have gotten an enclosed one. A hammock with a mozzie net would have been perfect. But no, again, I'm not organized enough for that. I'm much more. Because I'm curious and I have laid in a hammock back in Australia. I used to have a hammock at my home on the veranda. It was a double hammock. It was amazing. And I had many long rides end with a long session just doing nothing in that hammock. But I've never slept a night in one. What's it like sleeping in a hammock? Um, I have not really spent much time in a hammock before. I was, you know, with my mum in Sri Lanka, we were packing. I was packing for my next bit and she was like, you should take my hammock. And I was like, why? I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. And she, you know, she did a demo of this is how you put it up. And these are the tree protecting straps and, you know, give it a go. And I think the first time I strung it, I, it was like a bendy banana. I didn't know that you're meant to pull it really tight. So the first, you know, the first couple of days it was like, God, this is, rubbish I don't know how long I'm going to be able to spend in this hammock this is quite uncomfortable and then I think day I I can't remember a couple of days in I nailed it and I pulled it really taut I got the perfect distance between the the hammock ropes and it was like oh this is this is what sleeping in a hammock is meant to be like this is bliss because I pulled it so tight that actually the cover came up and came around me so it was almost like I was an enclosed hammock and it's it was super cozy but the other thing is usually you're so tired it doesn't really matter. You're going to fall asleep. Like even in the most uncomfortable position, you fall asleep. So, And you actually had some interesting sleeping spots during your trip as well. I often feel, again, people forgive me because when you do a trip so big, it, sometimes these questions are impossible because there's going to be multiple answers, which would be the right ones to this. But if I was to ask you what was the most bizarre place you 
you set up either your hammock or your bibby for a night's sleep. What would your answer be to that? Yeah, they would say really tricky and how do you choose from so many nights? A couple of choice, if I just briefly say a few, a couple of choice sleeping spots. South of France, I really struggled to find anywhere. I ended up in like this old, like almost like it was either a disused lay-by that had kind of been grown over or a, um, a new a plot for a new house to be built just beside the road. Yeah, hidden by some bush. It was like, sweet, no one can see me. This is perfect. Or an old lay-by on the Croatian coast rocky ass like photos of it my friends were like what how could you sleep here but again it's like it doesn't matter I was so tired like anything goes or probably one of my more outrageous spots was in Australia I got stuck on a road that got closed there was some crazy flooding in Queensland and um I got, there was a massive line of traffic everything was backed up the cars at the front had been there for three days and so I was riding along to the front being like oh I'll just go and inquire and see what's up um got to the front the policeman was like yeah we're not moving for 14 hours or something and so I looked around was like right where can I put my baby you know where is gonna be safe where's gonna be comfortable where's gonna be sheltered and there was a like a dry patch of trees but it didn't look very welcoming and then um a truck driver jumped out and was like what are you doing and I was like looking for somewhere to camp and he was like oh just camp underneath the truck so he disconnected his cab pulled it forward and gave me a space under his flatbed truck to string my hammock which I did and I was comfortably there for a couple of hours before another truck driver was like this is ridiculous get in the back of my lorry there's a double bed there in your suite so (laughs) it's one of those things you could plan for everything but you could probably never plan that you're going to be on a road in Australia that's closed due to severe flooding that has been for three days it's not reopening for 14 hours and it's going to see you sleeping underneath a truck and then inside the back of someone else's truck like these are the experiences that you can't pre-plan for and you must have had so many of these. Absolutely. And they're beautiful. You know, it's so beautiful. I think, and this is something I've spoken about before, but you plan and there's then that makes a freedom because everything's planned and you don't really have to think about it. You just have to do it. But then there's also a freedom from being unplanned. And it's just, it's balancing between the two. You know, it's having this idea of this is what I'm doing and I'm kind of going this way for this amount of time and we'll see what's up. And also just be like, I don't know. I'm so excited to not know. And it's awesome to see what happens and who I'm going to meet and and what experiences I'm going to have. Yeah, and I feel the freedom from not having things set down in a specific timeline and so planned in detail. What you've done is you've unlocked the adventure mode freedom, if that makes sense. Like You've gone into the secret unlock in the game, which means adventure is ahead of you and let's see what happens. I love that. I love that so much. So if we talk about route planning quickly then, how much did you, because, you know, if I look through your route, I can see you went through Europe, through the Balkans, you arrived in Istanbul in Turkey, you then skipped it, well, you you took a plane then to Sri Lanka. From Sri Lanka, you then went Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, and then you finish your trip in the U.S., was that always your intention for that type of route? Not going into the details of roads and how how far, but were they the countries you had? Had you selected these countries before you left or was there a freedom and flexibility even to that degree? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi, everyone. It's me, Bella, from the show. I just wanted to let you know about something exciting. I have recently just created a new Facebook group named Seek Travel Ride where if you are a fan of the show, you can join and we can actually bring this community more to life. It's a place where you can learn more about our guests, see more photos, chat about episodes in more detail, and maybe even pose some questions as well. It's also a place where you can share your own bicycle adventure journeys, whether you've got a photo or a blog or some videos that you want to share. Come online, say hi, join the Facebook group and let's enjoy this community that we have built. We have a global audience here. People are listening from all around the world and I think we can only thrive and get an even greater sense of wonderlust by sharing our experiences with each other and connecting. So get onto Facebook. I've provided a link in the show notes and you can join that community as well. Thank you. Now back to the show. No, I had planned. I had said, so actually I gave a presentation at my work of like, this is where I'm going. See you all later. And 
those the roots you know I'd drawn them out on Strava before and you know Europe was about four and a half thousand and then I knew I was going to Sri Lanka for this race uh for, I was competing in an endurance race there and um, which my mum had previously done and that was you know again initially when the idea for cycling came up it wasn't necessarily like oh, I'm going around the world it was like oh I'm just going to kind of connect a few dots I'm going to hang out I'm going to go to see my parents and she's like you know I'm going to do a race there and then I've got friends in Australia so I should probably cycle there but yeah if I look at the presentation so just before so obviously there were months in between deciding making the commitment leaving handing in my resignation working on my notice period and then going it did form a much more solid and looking at my roots although it was nothing like precise especially in terms of Europe and Southeast Asia but then places like Australia you know I had said originally I was going to go Darwin and then cycle through but I decided quite quickly that I didn't want to cycle from Darwin out to the coast so I changed my plans but there's kind of not that many choices I mean there's so many choices in Australia but there's also not that many choices you know to go from Cairns to Melbourne yeah there's not many roads you can take you get to a point where there's more roads but the more roads that you can take means you're really close to a city generally connecting the large towns together there's generally maybe one or two options exactly same for New Zealand I was like oh yeah I'll get to New Zealand and see what's up and just before I got there I messaged some friends and I was like okay so I'm going to New Zealand like this is what I'm vaguely thinking and I'd gone on Google Maps drawn a squiggly line up the country and then my friends were like oh you should go there you shouldn't go there but then even that I would get you know I got to New Zealand I did a couple of days and I was like oh now which way and then you have to think about it and go then that idea that it wasn't so much a route as a point of well I'm joining these moments and dots would to call them something else we'll talk about in, in Sri Lanka you did you did do an ultra cycling event it was the race race around the pearl or race the pearl race the pearl yeah okay now quickly you mentioned your mum had done a race as well does that mean your mum's into to cycling and into ultra cycling too Yes, yeah, so oh, I love this. <laughs> my so I have to give credit to my older sister. She got into cycling. She was the first of us. She decided to do a ten day trip to cycle from London to North Spain to attend a friend's wedding, and yeah, thousand kilometers, uh, ten days, a hundred kilometers a day, or something like that. And I remember at the time being like, oh yeah, that's cool, but didn't really, you know, they hadn't hit me at that point. But then me and my brother both kind of got into it at the same time started COVID and a couple of months in I think my mum was like oh this isn't fair I want to get involved too my mum's very she's a very cool kid you know she wants to be hanging out with us all the time so she picked up cycling they lived in Sri Lanka there was this endurance race called Race the Pearl which is top to bottom 600 kilometers in 24 hours my mum did it as part of a relay team so they four people 100 to 150 kilometers each to do the ride um and she did it and she then she was talking to us and said oh you guys should come out and do it so that formed you know the second leg of my trip also my my sister and my brother-in-law came out to do it too my brother-in-law won he came first overall which is awesome I came third first woman Woo! but third overall so yeah that was great it's really fun and you did it on your own not as a team of four and it's roughly about, yeah. and, and it goes from the top of Sri Lanka down to the bottom. Yeah. And so then, am I right then to, and uh, maybe this is um, ignorant of me not to know this, but is the Pearl sort of like a, a, another, you know, a way of Sri Lanka is called the Pearl? Yes, exactly. It's, I think, the Pearl of the Indian Ocean. And so it's about 600 kilometres. Yeah. Actually, I, I must admit, I, I read your post on your blog about this event and and something in there really resonated with me and and reminded me of one of my ultra experiences and I think it was like you're like kilometer 584 or something like that so very close to the end and then you're just wishing to have a a ride ending mechanical so you can get off your bike yeah I was so done can something happen that's out of my control to make this stop but how long did you take to ride 600 kilometers there the clock doesn't stop so I think my ride was like 22 and a half hours but of riding time, but 24 hours and eight minutes start to finish. So the aim is to do it in under 24 hours. And obviously I missed that by eight minutes. I was so sad. <laughs> I was like, oh God, I'm going to have to go back. 24 hours and eight minutes is just monumental. Do you feel that that's an itch you want to scratch to go 23 hours and 59 minutes? Uh, no, I mean, no, I'd... I'd um love to do it as fast as I can so my brother I'm very competitive my brother-in-law did it in 23 hours and five minutes he smashed the record by I think like 45 minutes or something like that uh the guy who came in second did it in 23 hours 45 
And then, yeah, I did it in 2408. I was happy I took the woman's record, so I think I took three hours off the woman's record. In sandals, I might add. At least the photo I've seen of you is in sandals. They're they're touring sandals. They're they're cushions. Uh, look, it probably would be for Sri Lanka actually, because the heat there would have been something to deal with. Is it humid as well? Because it's all around, like you know, entrapped by the ocean. <laughs> yeah, it was super humid, super hot, super rainy. We had everything. In fact, I think it started raining at like two, three p.m. and then it didn't really stop. Um, but sandals are the great, they are so unattractive. These things are awful. I went into Sigma Sport to buy them and I saw them and I was like, no, I do not want them. <laughs> they are just horrific, but actually they are the best things. I was told about them by other tours before I left. You know, I spoke to a few people before I left being like, watch, you know, if you were to advise me on anything. And one lovely lady said, foot rot is very common amongst endurance cyclists because you are riding for so long, your feet get wet, they're sweaty, it's humid, you can never really get dry. So sandals are the business, these specific Shimano ones. And oh my God, yeah, they're amazing. Super, super horrific in terms of what they look like, but also the best things ever, and I love them. (laughs) So you use them for your whole trip and you use them for that race. Do you use them now in the UK as well, like in London? Yep. Yep. Rock the socks, rock the sandals. And that's why you've got your woolen socks too, obviously. Yep. I <laughs> love it. We're talking about weather and, and, you know, the type of weather. That I'm imagining that this trip saw you with weather extremes. Would I be correct there? Because if you're leaving in October in Europe, does that mean, like, did you hit much of European early winter? I got so incredibly lucky that like my trip, you know, I just I kind of ever nervous to do another one because it was just so perfect in terms of weather I think through Europe I got one morning of a little bit of rain and that was it it was beautiful sunshine it was very warm I was chilly in my sleeping neck bag not not that I remember being super cold in through Europe but then you know Southeast Asia I experienced quite a lot of rain and wetness but through the majority of Southeast Asia I was staying in hostels I did camp but not often partly I didn't feel safe to camp I didn't feel like I could flag it you know if I was camping and also jungle I saw saw a couple of snakes (laughs) it was different I don't know why but it was different camping in Australia because again there's the language thing you know if you can explain to someone what you're doing I think that makes a big difference but yeah so Southeast Asia yeah sure lots of wetness lots of humidity lots of rain same in Australia very hot but nothing too crazy in New Zealand I was just going into their winter but again I got pretty lucky in terms of the weather really lucky actually and then America it got cold I was I was very chilly because I did America April I started like April 7th and yeah going up through the high desert I was froze but I survived what did you find more challenging then do you find it more challenging to be freezing cold or do you find it more challenging when you're cycling in say exasperating heat or a wet season downpour it's off the bike that really matters, right? Like on the bike, whatever, because in the heat, you kind of create your own breeze. You're good. Yeah. Like in Sri Lanka, when I did my circumnavigation, I was like, oh, this really isn't bad. It's exactly that until you stop and you're like, oh, I'm sweating everywhere. But it's off the bike that really matters. And so I really struggled with the cold. I really struggled in America. Did you have a strategy to help you there? Other than did you end up riding longer days so that you're not sort of and when I say longer days, I mean, you did some really long days, which your average daily length is more than most people will ever cycle a distance wise in a day. A lot of people would possibly maybe even keen cyclists may not even cycle this much in a week, let alone what you're doing in a day. I know before I press record, you mentioned that you're a data, you know, you like getting into the data. Did you crunch what your average daily distance was and what was your longest day? So I think on average, it might, like, and I'd set up with the idea I was going to do 200 kilometers a day. And so that held through Europe, that held through America. I haven't looked at the numbers in the middle. I've actually written everything down, pulled all out my Strava so I can do a proper summation so I know exactly what's saying. Just so I can know, um, I guess. But yeah, so on average, I was doing like 200 kilometers a day. My longest day was that maybe like 350k. Well, wow. so when I say were you doing longer days to escape from the cold in the US, I mean you're doing long days anyway. Yeah. But were you was there a strategy? Like what what was your strategy with the cold? Were you just resigning yourself to I'm going to freeze when I'm not riding? Pretty much, yeah. And I'd put on everything I had and then I'd try and do like um jumping jacks and sit ups before I got into my sleeping bag because that was something my sister said. She was like, 
your sleeping bag is only going to keep your warmth. It doesn't create the warmth. So, you know, try and get warm before you do. <laughs> and so, yeah, I don't know how much it works, but um, yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't really have a strategy in that. But again, you get to a point where you're like, you're so tired. You're just going to sleep and it might not be the most comfortable sleep. I might wake up. Like I woke up a few times because I was so cold and God, isn't the body amazing for telling you that? Like you need to get up and do something or you're going to be in serious problem. Sometimes your body just somehow jolts you into, hey, get going. Absolutely. And that's that's what I felt, you know, you were just like, okay, I can't sleep right now. You know, I can't. And so you'd be awake and then I'd be rubbing everything that I could and then say I'd be moving again. And so that was my strategy. It was just like, stay alive, stay alive. Something that actually comes up a few times in your blogs there as well, Pippa, is there's often, and it's because you're traveling in this manner and you're sleeping in this manner, you know, you've gone lightweight, you're doing long distances, you're eating what you can find a lot of the time, but you're, you know, you're talking about what's an acceptable level of hygiene that you've got now each day. I was like, oh, here I am. <laughs> Did it get to a stage like what was, uh, and I'm even trying to think of this, like I'm thinking personal hygiene, when, you, when, you, when you're choosing to bivy your way around the world, uh, you're looking for rivers and fountains and stuff to have a wash through Europe and like, you know, was there a state where you go, I'm just too sweaty and salty and I need a proper shower? Like what's going through your mind on these sort of trips? So it's such a funny question, is it? How good is your personal hygiene? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Oh my gosh, I don't want it to sound like that. No, no, it's it's totally good. I'm I'm here for it, you know. And it, these are things that are important to discuss. And and you're right. Like, how do you come up with it? Like, what what is your routine? How do you know what to do? So, for example, I left London and I cycled to the south of England to get the ferry over that night to France. And I got onto the ferry that night and I went to use the bathroom and I was like, oh, great, there's a sink. I'll have a quick sink wash, you know, and I was like, look at me, I'm so clean. And like that kind of sets the tone. So I have two sets of cycling kits. I'd wear one and I'd wash one. And every day I would put on a clean kit. And that was super important to me because I have heard you have to be super careful with hygiene and in the fact that if you are not clean, then you can get infections or you can start to hurt and horrible things. You know, I didn't want any part of that. So for the first 14 days of my trip through Europe, I would bottle wash. So every night before I got into my sleeping bag, I would make sure that my water bottles were full before I left the last town or whatever. And so my armpits and my bum always, and I'd be like, great, this is cool. I feel very clean. Day 14 was like, I think I looked in the mirror that morning and I saw rings of dirt around my neck. And I was like, yeah, well, I haven't been, I haven't been washing my neck. So that makes sense. So that day I got into the sea. And that was the most amazing feeling. I mean, there's also something to be said, right? The less you shower, the better you feel when you do actually shower. Yeah. Or get clean. So, uh, but there's an interesting thing uh, that I was thinking of just this morning. That day after my, after I got clean in the ocean in Croatia and washed my hair and felt absolutely phenomenal, I got back on my bike and I started riding. And then I was, I was followed by a, a man for a while in a van and then Oh, it got a bit unpleasant. He started furiously masturbating inside the road and then got back in the van and followed me for longer. And I was like, great. So this is what happens when you get clean. Also in New Zealand, I had a shower and then I went to, I went to a supermarket and some creepy old guy, you know, leered at me as I went in. And that made, that was one of those hallucinating moments you were talking about earlier where you just said my world went sideways and I saw like a red devil actually licking his lips. And it was the most horrible feeling. And I was like, lesson learned, don't be clean. And that actually is a thing. There is my lovely friends who were very worried about me in terms of safety. One of them messaged me with like t top seven tips from a cyclist. You know, um, Juliana, someone or other, she had the record for cycling around the world. And she'd written these tips and she was like, stay dirty, stay hairy, stay gross. And I was like, yeah, well, <laughs> I agree with that. So it's finding a line, you know, it's finding a line. Yeah. And, you know, it, it brings up something that with this podcast, I especially love highlighting the stories of, you know, women who do these sort of things, because I find as a woman, it's pretty empowering to hear what's possible, because we grow up, certainly I did in Western culture, growing up hearing, you know, what's not allowed and what's dangerous for us. And walking through the city at night, you're asking for trouble just because of your gender. And, you know, I hate that. 
and often, you know, it's it's interviewing amazing guests like yourself, people where you learn, well, actually, no, you can do these things. You, just because I'm a woman doesn't mean that I can't cycle through here. You know, I interviewed a guest, Nikki Ray. She cycled through all of West Africa, through countries that we're told not to go to, and she had an amazing time. But it does... It doesn't mean that you don't have unpleasant experiences, though, and that, that makes me a bit sad. Did it stop your trip, though? No, it didn't. I love that. I love that you kept going. But I couldn't imagine what it would have been like in the moment, like it was pretty unpleasant and vulnerable, probably. Yeah, absolutely. And there were so many times where you were just like, what can I do? And that was, uh, you know, and it is quite funny to think about being dirty and gross and being like, that is a, that is a deterrent. But then there gets to a point where you're like, I don't feel like myself. I need to wash. I want to get my eyebrows threaded. Like I want to look nice because I want to feel good about myself, not for anybody else. And then it was like times where I would always hide my hair. And I was like, I just hide my hair and put my hat on and try and look as manly as possible. Like I'd do stupid things like blow out my cheeks when late at night when cars were passing. So I looked and push out my arms. So I just looked a bit ridiculous. And that sounds so stupid. But these were just little things that I tried to do to kind of not look as vulnerable or not feel as vulnerable. But in terms of safety, actually, I think the thing that really comes to mind is it, it wasn't being a woman. It was being a cyclist. The roads around the world are terrifying. There were times where I thought I was going to die. And there were so many times like that where I was like, oh, that, I was almost killed. You know, just like that, because that's that's so sometimes for sure being a woman was really hard and little things, big things, people bothered me. But what was much more prevalent was, yeah, the danger from other road users. So there's certain people who will experience something, they love it and they'll go back. Say race the pearl, you had a great time, you loved it, you might go back. There's people who do it and they've gone, I've done that, what's next? But on your trip, not knowing which of those two sort of people you are, if that makes sense. Were there countries that you can't wait to go back and explore differently? Or in the same vein, were there countries from a, a, you know, a cycling perspective that you were like, I survived that and I have no intention of going back because it's not a great way to experience it on a bike? Great question. Great question. Tricky. Um, I, I mean, yes, I'd love to do it all again. I'd love to do it all again in exactly the same way. I'd love to do it all again completely differently. To your second, so yeah, like really, I'd love to explore loads of countries that I went through slower uh, or a different route or with people, whatever. It would be an amazing experience. But to your second point, sure. So New Zealand, New Zealand was one of my favorite places that I cycled. It was one of the best places that I cycled. The scenery was stunning. The people were amazing. And I have a lot of friends from New Zealand. And they hooked me up the whole way. It was it was really beautiful. Um, I would never, ever advise anyone to ride there, uh, road cycle. Never. I could not, with any good conscience, tell anyone to go because it was dreadful. I felt like there's some places where you can get, you know, the one or two bad drivers, like one or two out of ten. Other places that are maybe a bit worse, four or five out of ten. New Zealand, a solid nine out of ten drivers. It wasn't aggressive. I had some really aggressive drivers in Australia, infamous for not liking. Yeah, I've had that experience growing up as a cyclist in Australia, so i ashamed to say that Australia can have that experience on people, unfortunately. Not everyone, but it's the aggressive ones you remember. Yeah, absolutely. Not everyone and not all the time. But uh, no, it was New Zealand, which was the worst, which is really sad, as I say, because it was my favorite country, but it was definitely the worst place that I've ever cycled. I didn't expect that as an answer. Yeah, I never would have picked that from a cycling perspective. What about then, I and mean, we were talking about routes and, you know, you sort of planned roughly where you were going, maybe not specific roads. You'd mentioned there that you'd use Strava for your route planning. I often think, and I've, I've said it on a few different podcasts before, I often think no big cycle tour is complete without a route planning misadventure. And so sometimes you'll be cycling along and you're on a road bike and all of a sudden you're diverted down like this, this gnarly gravel road with rocks everywhere and you're thinking, how on earth am I getting through this? Did you have a similar experience anywhere at all with your route planning? And did you have a, a sort of route planning misadventure and one that really comes to mind? I mean, I definitely made some mistakes, like especially going through in Australia, I ended up on sometimes they have these like tourist drives and they're brown signs. So you're like, oh, that's going to be beautiful. And I went on and then it was like, oh, this is sand. 
this sucks. What is that called where it's um, corrugated? Is the bone jarring? Yeah, corrugations. <laughs> That was, I was like, oh my God. But then also it was kind of like one of the best bit, you know, it was such a beautiful ride and it was in the middle of nowhere and there were no cars and there were very few drivers. And so when it gets to something like that, like it is kind of scary because you're like, shit, if something happens, if something goes wrong here, I'm screwed. But also you're like, oh, there's such a joy to being alone and experiencing this just me. So another, I had, I cycled on the Ho Chi Minh Highway West in Vietnam and as soon as I was on it I was like oh god this was a mistake because my bike had started to make some funny noises and I was like it really you know again if something goes wrong and there'd been a couple of landslides on the road so no cars were able to get through so there were a few motorcyclists a few scooters and then me and it was again it's your kind of your it's that very fine line between fear and adrenaline and having an incredible time and being terrified but there, it's that sweet spot which is just right down the middle and you're like yeah I'm doing it. I'm crushing it. And this is great. I imagine then, Pippa, there were many moments during this time of yours, even though you're doing it so quickly, you would have had so many moments where you're just in your element, like you're in your state of flow then during this trip. For sure. I mean, there were times where I'd be like off on my pedals. More often than not, the sun was shining and I'd have the biggest grin on my st- my face. I got goosebumps quite a lot, actually, um, which is really funny. Like, Typically from nothing, like when I say from nothing, I mean just from by doing exactly what I was doing by virtue of living this dream. I'd, I'd say I'd be up on my pedals and I'd have this huge grin and then like my whole body would be covered and I'd be like, I'm doing it. I'm actually doing this. And it was just wild. It was like, so it was amazing. So I've got goosebumps just hearing you say that. Talking about natural moments and, and beautiful moments and, and scenery then, are you... Typically someone who prefers the mountains over the coast or? Oh, I couldn't make the, I love them all. I love them both completely. Uh, As we spoke about earlier, it was just, it's just the natural world. It's just being outside. It's experiencing that. That was just so incredible. Yeah. And I imagine you had your fair share of sunsets and sunrises as well. Absolutely. My favorite time was definitely dusk. Like I love it when the sun's going down. And again, it's that where like, you know, maybe it's starting, the warm is starting to drop off. So everything's starting to get a little bit cooler. The sun's gone, almost gone going. And so many other people are inside and I would be inside in a different time, in a different place. I would be inside. I wouldn't be experiencing this. And it was just like, this is it. This is what I love. This is so incredible. And I often would ride into the night. I would often stop at like 10, 11 p.m. And again, I love that. I love riding at night and under the stars. In fact, in New Zealand, I saw, well, I, through the whole world, I saw so many shooting stars, more in the last uh, seven and a half months than I have in the rest of my life, for sure. But in New Zealand, I was north of Auckland and I was cycling and it was maybe like 10, 11. And then just above my head, there was this huge, long burning shooting star. And it was, again, it was just like, this is crazy this is out of this world this is this is what this is what it's about what a gift wow i I just again as as my listeners know i'm an extrovert i'm 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 not too i'm not too shy when it comes to words but i don't know whether i'd be speechless or whether i'd just have a joyful shriek at seeing that like i'm just putting myself in your shoes and that experience is just filling me with joy just thinking about it yeah definitely laughed out loud cried I spoke to myself like you know you experience it sometimes I would yell like when I got into Istanbul I think I whooped cheesy as that sounds it was just like yeah I've done it you know and sometimes you do you just celebrate in whatever way feels right there's some special friends of mine and, and we have this thing well I don't know even how it started but definitely now if I go through a tunnel or something we let out a little wee <laughs> and we it, it actually comes from a Scottish word which when I read it I as an Aussie pronounced it weech but it's wee so it's got a really good guttural at the end of it and it's actually the Scottish word for sliding. I think my friend found it on like a children's playground and it's like the name of a slippery dip or something like that. So yeah, but you know, through a tunnel, I'm definitely a weaker. So <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter if there's other people there, I'm going to do it every day of the week. So I love that you did that. Like arriving in Istanbul would have been quite a pivotal moment for you because that's sort of like a significant moment where you've crossed Europe. That's the first sort of continent that you've crossed. 
Yeah, it was day 25 or something like that. And, you know, so although I didn't want to have time frames, I did because I was I had to get to Sri Lanka by the race. And Istanbul was the obvious place because it's such a hub to fly out of. And so, yeah, getting it's a funny story. I started at nine. I started at 7 a.m. in the morning to get as far to Istanbul, as close, sorry, to Istanbul as I could. But Istanbul was like 350 kilometers away. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to make it, but I'm going to try because I had a friend there who just happened to be there at the same time. And so she messaged me, you know, it got to like 9 p.m. that night. So I'd been riding for like 14 hours. I think I'd done 230 or something like that. And then she messaged to say, we're actually leaving tomorrow. So, you know, get here to buy tomorrow or we will miss you kind of thing. And I it's nine at night. I was like, I've got 120K to go or something. I can do it. So, yeah, it was. It was the longest day. It was in prep for the race. I was like, oh, I need to try and do some long days on the bike to make sure I can do 600 kilometers. So, yeah, it was this beautiful just joining of a lot of different things. Again, with the personal challenge, physical challenge, see how far I could go, how fast, and if I could actually stay on my bike for, I think that ride was 17 hours. So, yeah, it felt great. That's a massive ride. And actually, coming into Istanbul at night, because anecdotally I've been told by other people that Istanbul and the roads coming into it can be a little bit hectic to say the least. Did you find, was that your experience there at night time? It definitely played into, that was another reason why I wanted to get there. And I thought that getting there, you know, so I think I arrived in the city at 2 a.m. So I was on the real big roads at like midnight. And that's what I wanted. You know, I wanted to go at a time that wasn't as busy as it could be. And it was, it was quiet. It was terrifying still, but it was quieter. So yeah, it was good. Pippa, something that's come up when I was reading through your blog was about interactions with people. And I guess it it sort of starkly put front of mind to me, like traveling in this way, just how much time you would have just in your own company. But also being in countries where, you know, language and, and, you know, being able to understand and communicate what you need to to people becomes a bit more difficult as you cross different countries and stuff. You mentioned in one of your posts you know, your interactions with people have changed because you don't speak the same language and, and now you, you realise that you're interacting with a nod or a hand wave or single words or something like that. And anecdotally, you also mentioned that you've noticed that your interactions with people have more centred around ordering food or something like that. How did you find then, as your trip went on, those interactions with strangers? What sort of What sort of moments stick out in your mind as you're as you're crossing different countries and dealing with language barriers so I think to answer it in a roundabout way one of my key takeaways from the whole trip is that the world is full of the most incredible people just it's just amazing it is because again with the safety thing you know people are oh are you gonna be safe is it gonna be okay you're going all the way around the world you're alone and what's gonna happen People are just incredible. So many people wanted to help. Like I would find it really hard to choose my favorite country, but Cambodia and Malaysia were definitely up there. And it was just the sheer, yeah, we couldn't speak the same language, you know? And I was very conscious of it. I actually I got kind of frustrated at the end of Indonesia. Where, and myself, I was embarrassed because I was like, I don't speak Indonesian. Someone came up to me on a ferry and was like, oh, I'm really sorry. I don't speak any English, but how are you? <laughs> and I was like, well, your English is way better than my Indonesian, you know? So, I, yeah, it was hard. But you don't actually need much language to be able to communicate with people. If you're open to communicating in whichever way you can, whether it's smiling, waving, nodding, laughing, crying. But in Malaysia, I mean, there's so many stories of people being ridiculously generous. It was just incredible. But in Malaysia, yeah, it was Boxing Day, and I'd cycled out of Penang, and I'd had a really great morning. Met another cyclist. I was feeling awesome, and then a car. We were on like not a highway, but like a dual a dual carriageway or something like kind of getting out of the city, heading south to KL, and a car pulled over on the highway and summoned me over. And I was kind of like, oh, I don't really know what's going on here. I pulled in, and then he went back to his car and pulled out a plastic bag and walked over to me and said, "I saw you at the last traffic light, so I saw you a couple of hundred meters back." And I had to stop and get you something as a thank you for being a guest of our country. And then he handed me this bag and got back in his car. And I was like, what? No, I was so embarrassed and emotional. And I was like, what are you doing? What is this? And I opened the bag and it was a bottle of water, a bottle of electrolyte, a sweet bread and a salted bread. And it's just like, what? People are so kind. And yeah, I mean, as I say, that's it. The world is just full of the most incredible people. I loved it. I love it. I want to be that for other people. I see cyclists all the time now and I'm like, oh, should I stop and offer them something? 
can I get some water? Like cycling through central London, you probably don't need it. But it is, it's, yeah, that was one of my big lessons, I think. How could it not be? And it is, it's just that hospitality. People want to see you do okay. People want to do good for you. And just the idea, oh my gosh, you're visiting our country. I just need to thank you for that. We're not raised that way. Mm. Even just saying that phrase out loud makes me feel funny about it. Like we're not raised that way. Mm. Do we need to be? Or but but then an experience like this changes you. You mentioned how you feel changed from this experience. I'm guessing that's one of just many different things that have changed with you. Like what what have you reflected on in terms of how you've changed from doing something this big? I mean, sometimes you know you forget. It's almost like it feels like forever ago. Yes, I finished two months ago. But it feels like a whole different place and a whole different world. And that's, you know, when I said I was reading my notes and remembering things or having things brought back to me, I was like, oh, yeah, how could I have forgotten that? Because it felt so much at the time. But you can't process everything all the time always, can you? It's just that's not how we work. You can't carry it. In some ways, you like you can't carry it with you all the time. But in other ways, I'm like, no, I absolutely still carry it. And I still am that changed person. I will always be that changed person. But yeah, I mean, I try, I'm trying to think of examples of, there is, so j- just to go back to the whole, like, we're not raised that way. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Why, d- why do we need to be raised? But we also do need to be shown different ways. Like, I feel like I was shown a different way of living and a different way of being and a different way of interacting with people. And I hope that I can bring that with me. I hope that that can continue in that I'm like, I will ask for help because I think there's so much we need to be more community minded, like we need to be more community thinking in the way that if you ask for help, and you can also give help, it bonds you together, it bonds you closer to people, it brings us, yeah, just just more, it brings us closer. And so if I can ask for help and be vulnerable, then other people can ask for help also. And then we can all just just be better together. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. Or that sounds funny. No, it does. It's, it's also allowing yourself to be vulnerable. It is okay to need someone to help you out. Like it is okay to ask for assistance and, you know, maybe knock down that level of inner pride, that stoicism or whatever it is, whatever we want to call it. And then through that, those experiences of being a solidarity of community sort of come through from that then as well, I imagine. Again, and and notwithstanding the distances you travelled and stuff, I'm sure that there's things that didn't go to plan for you on this trip. There were things, and not traffic and busy roads, but things that could have been a showstopper for you, people helped you out with. Oh, absolutely. I was late, late one night cycling in Vietnam and my free hub broke. And so, you know, the free hub rear wheel. Oh, I've had it happen to me. That's not something you can fix on the side of a road. Exactly. It happened to me before in London, so I knew exactly what it was. And I was like, oh, shit. And somebody, then a group of people stopped and they were like, what are you doing? You tried to help again language but it wasn't a problem you just act it out <laughs> and someone someone will come pick up the bike and have a go and with the free hub you can't move you know you just so you're pushing your bike but then through non-verbal communication I communicated that I needed to get to the next town to have this looked at somebody on a scooter drove behind me and pushed my they put their foot on my cassette and pushed me up up a hill and then down the hill, I was able to freewheel to a hotel for the night. And then, then going into that hotel, I checked in and someone checked in just behind me with a car, with an empty car. And I was like, oh, where are they going? And I asked to help translate from the hotel manager. He was like, yeah, they're going to Ho Chi Minh City tomorrow, which is like 100 kilometers away. I was like, sweet, I need to go to Ho Chi Minh tomorrow. Is there any way that we could put my bike in the back of the car and then go with and, you know, it is that. It's like when I talk about it now, it's kind of like, oh, you sound really cheeky or really like over presumptuous. But again, it's just that like asking for help and putting yourself out there and being like, do you know what? Cool. We'll see. Because, again, it's just that you make connections with people. You have a different experience. Like if I was just super closed up and be like, oh, no, I can't ask. I can't possibly. I'll just wait on a bus or I'll do it. You know, it's just like just grab any opportunity you can and see what happens. And sometimes they'll go wrong for sure. But sometimes it's great and it all works out well and you've had a wonderful experience. Again, experiences you can't pre-plan for. Uh, the best experiences sometimes happen through, and misadventure is not the right word for this, but often the best experiences happen through adversity. And I feel like that is definitely something that would have happened many, many times. I must say, I visually was picturing someone with a foot on the cassette of the bike to wheel it along. I'm thinking, wow, that's that's ingenious as well. Just 
However you can move forward, right? Yeah, I mean, I'd seen a lot of it through different places or people on scooters, like pushing cyclists along with their hand on their back, one hand on the scooter, one hand on your back. And like, oh, that's so risky. But again, like people just do. You just make do, you get on with it. It's awesome. Okay, so speaking of something that's awesome, and this probably speaks to, to my personality and my heart, when I hear about and, and read about people who, who've done adventures like you have, I often think straight away of experiences, not just culturally, but food, food experiences. I feel you, you can't go on an adventure like this and not talk about food. And I realise with the monumental distances you were travelling, some days food for you was what, what can you buy at a service station. But I imagine that you had some pretty sweet moments when it came to food as well. Would I be right in assuming that? Like, especially my mind goes straight to Southeast Asia, FYI. Yeah. Was food a motivator for you and how? I don't even have a question other than food. It's fine. We can absolutely talk about food. I'm good at talking about food because food was really hard for me. Nutrition was really hard. I messed up for sure. I'm vegetarian. I was actually vegan before I left on the trip for about six months. And then before getting into the trip, I mean, I dabbled in veganism for a while, but I knew before going on the trip, I was like, I'm going to have to switch to be veggie. Uh, I think veganism is too hard to do on a trip like this. I've been veggie my whole life. So I wouldn't, I would never consider going carnivore, but I was like, cool. Okay. I can definitely do veggie. Europe was good. You know, as you say, sometimes it's like, whatever, you'll just get what you can. And it was always a couple of pastries in the morning and then whatever you could find for lunch, supermarket or stopping. I did stop occasionally, not, not often. I like food, but it's also not top of my list, top, top of my list. Southeast Asia, I mean, one day there was not, I was on this back road in the middle of nowhere, the one that I was talking about before, the Ho Chi Minh Highway West. I had two bags of nuts and a bag of Harry Bows, 225 kilometers. I don't know my climb. It was quite high. It was quite hilly. And I got to somewhere super late that night, stopped at 1130, couldn't get any food. So I was in a massive food deficit. And the next day I sat down in a town for lunch and I had three meals in one go. And then I just started the cycle of like binging and not eating and then just continually. So yeah, I found nutrition really, really tricky. And that's one thing I want to learn and do better because it's so important. I got great at doing, I mean, I I also, I'm a really simple person. Uh, I love little, I love picnics. Picnicking is the best. So although the food in Southeast Asia was incredible, like I remember a city called Hue, I had one of the best meals, I think probably of my life, of a noodle dish with tofu in a way that I've never had it before. And then spring rolls. And Vietnamese spring rolls are like no other spring rolls, right? Have you been to Vietnam? Have you had spring rolls there? I haven't had them in Vietnam, but I I mean, living in Australia, Vietnamese cuisine, it won't be the same, but I have definitely had what you were talking about. Sure. It was just like this flaky pastry on the outside. It was just, it was outrageous. It was like, this is the best thing ever. Yeah, actually, I was super excited to get to Australia to shop again. You know, I wanted to supermarket shop. I was like, I just want cereal. I want muesli and yogurt. And that's the first, I went to Woolies and uh, Cairns and I bought a kilo tub of yogurt and a 750 gram bag of muesli. And that's what I ate for like the first 24 hours. It was just heaven. I was like, this is what I want. And then I'm just remembering some dodgy as picnics, let's call them across America, where, yeah, shopping through, especially through the West, where there's shops few and far between. It's like I'd buy boxes of Ritz crackers and I'd have Ritz dipped in peanut butter. And then where I could, sometimes I'd have like SpaghettiOs or cans of baked beans, cold, just straight, you know, gross, but great. They did exactly what they needed to do. They did what they said they needed to do on the tin. It's funny when we're talking about that, like what gives you comfort is just like a little of yogurt and some muesli. Sometimes it's the simple things which give us the most joy. Yeah. Did you get food fatigue as well? You were like, oh my gosh, I just don't want to just eat the same thing again. Or it was just more, were you different with your mindset on food? Of It's going to be what it's going to be and I just need to eat whatever I can get. Yeah, I was very much that. You know, I'm not, I, as again, I'm a simple person. I was, I was never really like, I think for my birthday, we, my brother came out to join me for 10 days of riding in Australia. That was the only time anyone joined me on the trip. And it was amazing. And it was also really hard <laughs> because I'd just been alone for however many months and then have someone come and join me. And it's really annoying. My brother has a very high level of fitness even though he's not as keen a cyclist as I am. Yeah, and he'd get on and be like, come on then, 
hurry up. <laughs> but he was like, it was my birthday when he was there. So we went out for a meal and we spent, we you know, we went to a cafe, got a really nice meal. That was great. But actually I much preferred our evening one, which was a, a can of spaghetti, a can of baked beans and a banana bread for an eighth of the price of the meal out. You know, it's just like, yeah, this is, you know, it was probably always quantity as well over quality. I mean, it was insane how much I've eaten. It's a lot. That was also, it was a really tricky ending and then trying to wean off eating so much because it got to the point where I just like want to stuff all the time. This is hitting me now. So my most recent trip, I just rode across the Pyrenees from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. Pales into insignificance if I'm trying to compare it with you, but it was a, it was a big moment for me. There were a lot of climbs on that trip and it's ended, but days later, I'm just like ravenous all the time. It's like, I cannot feed the hole in my stomach with enough food. (laughs) It's funny, for that whole trip, taking it back to basics, we didn't eat out all trip, camping all trip, just supermarket shops, camped pasta. I ate pasta 10 days in a row, and it was simple pasta with, you know, like some vegetables through it and some oil or something like that and butter generally because it was easier to get. But I have come home thinking, initially thinking I've had pasta for 10 days in a row, I'm not eating pasta. I can't admit to you how many times now since coming back where I'm like I'm just gonna have a pasta because I'm just hungry all the time when does that end Pippa when does that end (laughs) it does it does end thankfully because for a while I was thinking this is a serious problem and I don't know how I'm gonna be that was a lot of thought on my bike as well you know a lot of the time you're thinking about food because you're like well at least with me I don't know if it was psychological but I was like when I stop I eat and so then my body and because I wasn't stopping very often and because I was riding such big days I think my body was like you need to eat more you know you need to or is that is that like you need to stop more you need to eat more I don't know I kind of felt I'd I developed a, a food addiction but it has massively decreased now you know I'm I'm still probably eating more than I should but it's it's better than it was I'm less the first couple of weeks when I stopped in New York, I was literally eating all the time. It was it was grim. I made it through the other end, so you will too. Second breakfast, third breakfast, eleven Z's. Oh yeah, everything in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Third dinner. Oh no, it's cool. You mentioned there when your brother joined you, it was hard because you had gotten used to just spending so much time riding on your own. It was cycling so much on your own? Is that something that you knew that you were comfortable with beforehand? Had you done? any sort of longer longer trips totally solitary no no that was my first time uh I don't think I'd even camped out alone you know the only other time I'd been camping was with Lizzie on that fun trip or my brother on the jog so yeah the first couple of nights camping alone terrifying like I woke up with sleep paralysis imagining that was someone in my bivy it was really scary but there was such a joy to it as well because I have spent a lot of time alone the first COVID lockdown and in other lockdowns since I was living by myself and so I got I was very used to my own company and then I love writing so it's kind of a combination of you know doing something that I loved and also being alone which was a state that I was I'm natural in I got very well with it. Is that a change like for your cycling now are you a social cyclist like back at home now or do you yearn time on the bike on your own now more i haven't really gotten on my bike very much since finishing i have done i've done bit there was no there was none of this like what's it called tapering i when i stopped in new york i stopped and i didn't get on for i think a week and a half and then i did a couple of smaller rides and that was fun yeah, I haven't since being back in the UK. I mean, I haven't really spent much time in one place. I've been doing lots of traveling around to see different people. This last weekend, I did a beautiful ride with 20 women. And that was really fun. It was hard. It was very different because I'm not used to cycling with anyone, let alone 20 people. And then also just doing lots of talking and and, and being in big groups. I'm not used to quite, I'm not quite used to being in big groups yet. So that was, it, it was awesome. It was really cool, but it was also a challenge. It's interesting how things like that change us. Before moving to this side of the world, all my cycling in Australia, I would say 90-odd percent of it was always social. So it was always meeting friends or groups or my best friend or 
it always revolved around it was always in Australia definitely my culture of cycling was we're, we're going for a ride but really we're just going to the bakery like you know <laughs> we're cycling there and back like yeah. again food there's a theme here Bella and it was actually when we were in lockdown in Europe because we had we left Australia and weeks later COVID happened so we hadn't made friendship networks or anything brand new country we were in Ireland and I definitely noticed that about my cycling and my personality here had changed in that I started yearning just being on my own on my ride so it is amazing how for different reasons we can change those things and anecdotally I've, I've ridden with some other people since but and I don't and I do love that time it's always a nice time to be with a group it's not that I resent being there but there's something extra special to me now personally about my alone time on a bike and I wonder if if that's sort of a similar thing for yourself there as well absolutely I mean it's it's very precious isn't it it just being able to do something you love alone and not having and this was something I really messed up with when my brother came to join me I was so worried about him having a good time and him being satisfied with what we were doing and Whereas I should have just been like, I'm doing something I love and you've come along for the ride. Let's just ride. Like, why be so worried? And and I think it's, I think naturally I'm a bit of a, I want to make people, other people feel comfortable and host them and make sure that everyone's good. And when you're doing that, when you're riding with other people and always checking in and making sure they're okay, you just lose some of that joy for yourself. And it's either right, you learn how to temper it better and you learn how to say, oh, they've told me that they're fine. Just believe it and just go with it. Trust other people and not always checking in and worrying or just totally not having any of that because you're just alone and that's what's kind of, that's perfect and joyful in itself. What I love about what, how we've been talking about this, Pippa, is we haven't sort of drilled into specifics about countries and stuff. It's, it's more moments that we've talked about and feelings and experiences, which is really what I wanted our conversation to have. So what was it like stopping then and getting to New York and thinking, that's me now, my, my trip's, this is where I'm ending my trip. How was that moment? It was amazing. It was so, so phenomenal. So when I was, when I'd stopped in other places, and I did, I took a couple of days here and there. I took a week in Sydney. I took two weeks in Darwin, hanging out with friends. I took a little bit of time in New Zealand. I felt great in those moments, some some places I felt like, oh, kind of, in Sydney, I was kind of like, oh, I kind of want to keep going, you know, because I'm not done yet. I'm not finished. Whereas in Darwin, I knew I'd finished Australia. So I was like, oh, I'm just ch- hanging out and having a really nice time. But there was still this kind of like underlying, I know I have more to go. And there's still so much more of the journey to do. America, America was actually the hardest country that I did. I don't know if it was month seven or six on the road at that point coming from New Zealand which had been so incredible for people and very social America and I hadn't really planned it was the first time I'd been to America in a long time there was lots of things on the go actually uh, I was hit for the first time by a car so yeah I found America very tricky that it kind of played into I think the end feeling so wonderful in that I was like I've done it I've survived I've made it I hadn't been, I used to live in New York. I hadn't been back to New York in seven years. It felt very much like a homecoming. I cycled into New York from, you know, I woke up on the last day of my tour in Philadelphia and I was like, oh, it's like 170K to New York. I hadn't actually planned to do it. I planned to cycle to New York and spend the night there before riding into the city the next day. But that morning I just, I'd woke up and I was like, do you know what? Today's the day. And I messaged my friends in New York saying like I think this is it I think I'm gonna finish tonight I'll see you later and it was just it was perfect it was just the most beautiful end really wow and it felt an appropriate way to finish such a monumental trip like those feelings were of completion of happiness of arriving your homecoming you sort of saying as well yeah far out definitely I know this sounds weird and I've said it a few times but I've got goosebumps just thinking about these moments for you because I just feel they're so impactful ones we were talking and you've mentioned this a few times sort of looking back through your own notes and reflecting back on moments in the trip do you ever look back on it and apologies I'm trying to figure out how I should word this but like I read about something like someone like yourself doing what you've done, I feel a sense of pride for you. And you know, to my listeners, it's not like we're best friends or anything. I don't, I don't know you much at all, other than through this amazing experience that you've done. Do you look back on this trip with 
is there an overwhelming feeling when you reflect back on what you've achieved and what would that feeling be? Gosh, that's a hard question. Sorry. <laughs> I haven't, I would say it's, it's too big. You know, it's too big to look at as a whole and be like, it's kind of like that question, like, oh, how was it? You're like, oh, it's great. <laughs> it's it's through all the little things. At the moment, I have stopped, you know, when I've stopped now and I'm hanging out in London, I'm not doing very much. I'm not, I'm seeing a few people on an individual level, but I'm not doing, I'm very happy to sit on the sofa and, and or sit at home and just feel safe, which is a really funny thing. So I think I'm still, I'm still recovering as it were. I'm so kind of coming down. I look back and I just think, yeah, that was amazing. And then I'm also like, what's next? You know, what else have you got going on? What's what's to look forward to? Because I don't, I don't feel an over an overwhelming sense of pride or that I've done it. I'm just like, yeah, that's that was cool. There's still so much more to see. There's still so much more to go. Because because sometimes the question is, do you believe that you've done it? If that makes sense, like, has it actually sunk in? I feel like you you do believe you've done it. So when you talk about what's next, and sometimes I hate asking these questions. It's it's okay to do what you're doing now and sit on the couch and just be and just enjoy the moments and stuff. But is there a mind to what's next? And does that involve a bike trip? Or is it something totally different? Um, I'm still figuring it out. But what's immediately next, before I left, I'd signed up to do an ultramarathon um, with a couple of friends. So... In two weeks, I think, uh, I'm running 50 miles in the Lake District. So, yeah, just last week I did my first marathon. I'm not a runner, <laughs> but I now believe I can do anything. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so the, the trip has left me with this feeling of, like, I can do whatever. If I put my mind to it, I can do anything. So signed up to do an ultra marathon with some friends, and then uh, that leaves August and September to figure out what's next. I have two... I have different ideas, but yeah, a bike would be wonderful. I'm considering doing riding from London to Cape Town, South Africa. And then if I survive that, go Argentina to Alaska. I don't know. Like these are huge plans, but part of me is just like, yeah, it's good. I can do it. Now's the time. Wow. Okay. I'm going to ask. Oh my goodness, people. I must apologize because I feel I look at the clock and I go, oh my gosh, how much have I been speaking? I'm in my flow state now and I'm not on a bike, but I'm I'm just feeling a sense of flow. So I apologize for taking your time. But say you do do that trip, London to Cape Town or, you know, Ushuaia to Alaska, what would you change? Is there anything that you would change and what have you learned from this experience that you would change moving forward? Uh, it's really tricky because part of me thinks I would do things very differently and like looking back, I'm like, oh, did I move too fast or did I you know how can I slow it down but then also once you're on the bike sometimes you're just like I just want to go I just want to move I love this you know I met other people who were like oh yeah I'm going like 20 or 30 miles a day and you're just like oh god that sounds terrible <laughs> and it's not it's just that everyone's different everyone has different ways to do it so you know how I might do it might be completely different I might take I might do like 100 kilometers a day rather than 200 I might stop for more than a day in some places Maybe I'd take a week. Maybe I'd work somewhere. Maybe I'd pick up, like I've always been interested in doing woofing, you know, working on organic farms or a workaway or something like that. I, I have no idea. I also think that before I did South America, I'd really love to learn Spanish. It, like I've always wanted to learn a second language. I'm very embarrassed in the fact that I don't. And I think it would really deepen the experience. So then it's like, oh yeah, maybe I could figure out a language school or something like that on the way. I just, I have no idea because then part of me is also like, I remember sometimes when I stopped on the road last time and I was like, I don't love stopping. I don't actually enjoy this that much. I want to keep going. So yeah, I do think next time I would take a tent. I think a tent, like, although I loved sleeping out under the stars and having my face out was just the best thing. Really, there is no feeling like it, like falling asleep and waking up at like three o'clock and being like, oh yeah. I'm still there <laughs> the moon is and then waking up and being like oh I survived another night because sometimes it was scary I did think about the snakes and scorpions and spiders and coyotes and mountain lions it was just like oh god I must be mad but I would I would say I think a tent for safety wise I think that was that would be the my major change and a sleeping bag I want to um write to the sleeping bag company and say you know your sleeping bag is not, it didn't do what it said it was going to do. It did not keep me warm. 
let's try and find a solution because um yeah i don't believe the numbers but yeah i don't know i just feel a sense of excitement there because i think you're pondering the right questions in that you know maybe i would change things but i think if it's anything that i reflect back on what you've been recounting about your experiences from this trip Pippo, it is that how you do this experience is just whatever makes you feel happy you don't need to be the person that has to stop for a few days if it's not making you happy. If you feel like you want to travel big distances and keep going and that makes you happy, you're doing the trip correctly. Mm. Um, it's This is a trip for you. It's not a trip for others. It, it doesn't mm. have to fill someone else's tick box. It just has to be right for you in that moment, which is great. Oh, my gosh. So I do have to wrap things up. And I knew this was going to happen because whenever someone does something like this and is so candid about their experiences in the way that you are. The, the conversation can just flow for hours. I'd love to be by a campfire with a with it with a drink or something and just be. Maybe one day. Maybe one day. Oh, I, I'm I'm totally open to an invite. <laughs> okay, so two questions that I like to finish my show with, and I ask this of all my guests. They're pretty simple ones. I am actually not sure if I know the answers to to one of them, and that that is. Uh, if you're given the choice one day to cycle up a constant climb or into a perpetual headwind, which one are you going to choose? Oh, it totally depends. I mean, I've done both. <laughs> I've done both and sometimes they've been horrible for different reasons and sometimes they've been wonderful. So, yeah, I'd find that really hard to answer. Oh, fence sitter. I feel like I need to push you off the fence, though. Are you, are you more a climber or a flatland rider? That might be the answer we're after here. I'd go climb. I'd go climb. Because I love descending. I love climbing. I also love descending. So when there's a hill, typically there's a way down at the end, which there's is always fun. There's a way down. Oh, brilliant. And the last question, Pippa, and that is if you're given the choice one day that you're going to be on your bike for four hours, which FYI realize is like a really short ride for you, but <laughs> just, just, just go with the question here because we're keeping sure. it uniform across all the guests. So you're on your bike for four hours and you have the option of cycling four hours on your own or four hours with other people. Which one are you going to choose? I think I'd probably choose to be alone. No, I thought that might be the case. I thought that might be the case. Pippa Langan, it has been an absolute pleasure. I have absolutely loved hearing just a small fraction of the experiences that you had on this beautiful journey of yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's a real joy to talk to you. You've got great energy and um, it's really fun to reflect. It's still, as I say, it's still something uh, I haven't done very much. So thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. Oh, no worries. I have your details. So maybe one day we'll re-pick this up around a campfire. And um, I'm certainly going to be keeping track of you to, to see where these next adventures go. Actually, quickly, for my listeners, if they do want to discover a bit more about your trip, you're not on social media, really, are you? No. Nope. If people want to find out more about this adventure of yours, the best way to do it is through your blog, isn't it? Yeah, my blog is up at the moment. Uh, it's called Postcards from Pippa. So postcardsfrompippa.com or Strava. All my rides are on Strava. Brilliant. Okay, so I will post links to both of those in the show notes and people can keep track of you and um, and see when your Strava starts moving from London towards Cape Town. <laughs> <laughs> if that happens, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much, Pippa. That's brilliant. Awesome. So wonderful chatting. I was absolutely captivated with that discussion that I had with Pippa, learning so much more about her monumental trip all over the world, really. It's interesting. I've interviewed a few people who've travelled the world by bicycle now. I must reiterate, it's such a privilege. Yet Pippa's approach to me just seems so different in that she's covering such vast distances in such a lightweight style, choosing just to pack a bivy choosing to not set plans or structures, but also just day after day doing these massive, massive kilometres. Yet it was really evident to me that her trip was just full of amazing experiences that she's now drawing on at the moment. I'm really keen to see what's up ahead for Pippa as well, and I thank her for sharing her story with our listeners. I also want to take the time to thank you, our show's listeners, for just spreading the word and getting this show out to such a wide audience. It is growing and growing at a phenomenal rate, and I am so excited about this. 
I'm also really thankful for those of you who've reached out, sending emails, letting me know how hearing stories from the guests is inspiring them and also hearing about what adventures they're having. I've got an eye on my guest lists coming up and I know that you're all going to be thrilled to see what interviews are rolling out each week. So if you haven't done so already, make sure to hit follow on your podcast player so that you get told when new episodes roll out. And if you'd like to give the show a rating and a review and show us some love there, you can do that in your podcast player as well. I read them all and appreciate them all so, so much. As always, if you've got your own adventure on a bike, as I mentioned there, send me an email, podcast at seektravelride.com, and we can go through the process about setting up an interview so that you can share your story with our listeners as a guest of the show. Until the next episode, I'm Bella Malloy. Thanks for listening.